All right, let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to be together, to gather, to worship you, to hear from your word, to seek you. Uh, We pray that you would um, just enlighten our minds as we hear your word, and we pray that you would cause us to grow in wisdom and uh, and to know you. And we thank you for your grace, and amen. All right, so today's sermon is called Examining Your Faith. Uh, Today we're going to look at Uh, what the Bible says about conversion, and what the Bible says about examining ourselves to make sure we're actually in the faith. Um, I think this is a topic that's pretty important, and I started working on this sermon a few weeks ago, and I've put about twice as much hours into it as I usually do for a sermon. That might also be because I accidentally made it longer than I intended to make it. We'll see if it ends up being two parts. But um, anyways, the subject of like examining our faith is important. I say that to say that. Um, and the reason we need to examine our faith, or the reason that you know the Bible talks about it, is because the problem of uh, false conversion, or of thinking you're in the faith if you're not, is a real problem. And the Bible talks about it. Uh, But before we get into any of that, I I do want to say up front that this is not something a person has to keep worrying about. It's not something that a Christian should keep worrying about. The Bible warns us to examine our faith, but after genuinely examining ourselves uh, to see whether or not God has done a work in our hearts, God wants us to have assurance of our faith and of his salvation. So I don't say this to cause worry. This should not cause ongoing worry. Christians should not keep on worrying about this. So let's start with some definitions. Um, I want to define conversion. Conversion can mean different things in different contexts, so I want to give a clear definition for what I mean in the context of this sermon. For the purposes of this sermon, when I use the word conversion, I mean that a person has been born again by the Holy Spirit, they've believed the gospel, and they have turned to Christ in repentance and submitted to him as Lord, and they are under the blood of Christ, and their sins have been forgiven. So I also want to define what I mean by false conversion. Uh, When I say false conversion, I mean that a person thinks they are a Christian, but they actually have not received Christ. They they have not either not believed in Christ or not repented and turned to Christ. They're still under the wrath of God. Their sins have not been forgiven, and the Holy Spirit has not done a work in their heart to make them born again. So those... Um, For the context of this sermon, that's what I mean by conversion and false conversion. So the Bible says in two different places, it kind of talks about examining ourselves for evidence of real conversion. Let's look at 2 Corinthians uh, 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So the Bible talks about how if a person is converted, if a person is born again, there should be fruit from that. There should be differences in their lives. The change that the Holy Spirit has caused in them should be manifest. And if it's not manifest, then that's cause for concern. And uh, we'll look at that more in depth. Um, But before we look at that more in depth, I want to start out with um, giving an overview of a biblical understanding of conversion. Uh, Because if we're not going to bother to look at what the Bible says about conversion, then um, that could just lead to a lot of confusion. So let's, I want to look at three things that the Bible says about conversion. Number one, uh, conversion involves repenting and believing and trusting in Christ. Conversion involves simply repenting and believing. Let's look at Mark 1, verses 14 through 15. 
Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Uh, So that's, you know, one verse that talks about repenting and believing. We're going to look at some verses that talk about repenting and then some verses that talk about believing. Let's look at Acts 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Mark 1, verse 4. John appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let's look at Luke 13, verses 1 and 3. There were some present at that very time who told him about the who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you all likewise will perish. So repentance is a a necessary part of conversion. If a person has not repented, if they have not turned to Christ in submission, they have not been converted. But believing and having faith in Christ is also, uh, you know, a big component. It's the other key element. Uh, Let's look at some verses that talk about that. Let's look at Romans uh, 10 verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's look at Acts 16, uh, 25 uh, through 34. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of, of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everybody's bonds were unfastened. That's not too good for the jailer. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before him. Before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that they had believed in God. Let's also look at Romans 4, verses 1 and 3. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was not a righteous person in and of himself, because no one is. Abraham had sinned. Abraham sinned, you know, regularly, just like everyone does. But he believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So conversion involves repenting and believing. And, you know, you need to have... Both. A person needs to believe and repent, to repent and believe. Let's look at James chapter 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also by itself, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. What he's really saying is that if a person um, claims to have faith, but doesn't have, you know, 
any fruit of the Spirit, they don't really have faith. If they don't have enough faith to submit to God, they don't actually believe that God is good. A person does not repent or believe in order to earn God's forgiveness. It's impossible to earn God's forgiveness. But repenting and believing is the means by which we receive the gift of God's forgiveness. So that's one aspect of conversion I wanted to look at. Conversion involves repenting and trusting in Christ. It's a free gift. Uh, The second aspect I want to look at is that no one can be converted apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. No one comes to Christ apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to look at three verses that talk about that. Let's look at John uh, chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Uh, Let's also look at John 3, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus is saying that there has to be a work that the Spirit does that causes a person to be born again. How were you born? Did you have any control over it? Did you decide to be born or to be conceived? (laughs) Exactly. You couldn't remember. No, you did not decide to be born or to be conceived. It is totally outside of your control and totally up to someone else. And being born again of the Spirit is totally up to the Spirit. It's something he does, and there's nothing you can do to do it yourself, just like there's nothing you can do to be born physically. A person still has to repent and believe, but if a person does repent and believe, the Spirit has been drawing them to repent and believe. Uh, I also want to look at Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we were dead in our trespasses before, you know, before we came to Christ. What can dead people do to be alive? Nothing. The only way a dead person could become alive Well, for one, it takes a miracle of God, but that miracle has to be done by the living, either by the living God or God working through a living human. The dead don't raise the dead. The dead do nothing. So that's the second aspect of conversion I wanted to look at, um, that no one can receive Christ apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The third aspect I want to look at is that true converts, true believers, someone who's really received Christ, will persist in the faith. Let's look at Matthew 13, uh, verses 18 through 23. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Um, So this is Jesus' explanation of the parable of the sower. Apparently in my notes I forgot to include the parable itself. Um, But you know, a sower went out to sow and he sowed seed in different places. And um, Okay, 
He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and... No, that's the wrong one. Uh, (laughs) Anyways, uh, we'll move on. So here, then, the explanation of the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. For um, what was sown on the rocky ground, this is one who hears the word immediately and receives it with joy. So they hear the word and they receive it. Yet uh, he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while, and then when tribulation or persecution comes on account of the word, he immediately falls away. So what Jesus is saying, if, you know, if he had truly received the word and it had um, done the work in him, he wouldn't have fallen away. And that's just proof that the, um, you know, they weren't born again. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and prove it unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in one another sixty, and another thirty. So that's uh, one verse that shows that if God does a work of conversion in someone's heart, that person will uh, stay in the faith. That doesn't mean that they won't have problems with sin or even major problems with sin, as we'll get into in a second, but God will preserve them. Let's also look at uh, Hebrews 10, 23 through 29. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, uh, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but feel for our expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and outraged the spirit of grace? So this verse used to always really confuse me. Um, That sounds weird. Uh, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of, for sins? That seems strange. I thought, you know, once saved, always saved. But then I came to realize that what this is talking about is if a person has really come to Christ, if a person has been born again and received Christ, this won't happen to them. They will persevere in the faith. And the writer of Hebrews says that later in the same chapter. Hebrews 10, verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So that is another verse that shows that uh, if someone is converted by the Spirit of God, that person will persist in the faith. The Bible doesn't teach that a Christian can fall away from the faith, but if a person does, quote-unquote, fall away from the faith and not repent, that they were never actually a real convert or real Christian at all. Let's look at John 2, verses 18 and 19. 1 John 2, verses 18 and 19. That's an important distinction. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they were not uh, of us. So John is talking about people here in this verse that were never true Christians to begin with. Let's look at some other verses in 1 John that show uh, how God protects believers so that they won't fall away. God protects 
true converts and Christians that they won't fall away. Uh, 1 John uh, 3, verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning or continues ongoingly in sin. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. That doesn't even... uh, Believers can't even fall into a season of unrepentant sin, but it will come to an end. He cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Let's look at uh, 1 John 5, verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God, as in Christ, protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. So God is the one who preserves Christians. It's not something that we have to worry about doing. God will do it. It's a work of God that he preserves his people. And, you know, true Christians may fall into serious sin or unrepentance for a time, but they'll not stay there. Peter denied Christ. That's serious sin. But he didn't stay there. He repented of it. An even bigger case of it is David uh, committing adultery and murder. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and he murdered her husband. And I'm pretty sure he stayed in a state of non-repentance for those things for months. I don't think Nathan confronted him until after the child had been born. I was reading it yesterday, and the way it's worded to me implies that the child was born before Nathan confronted him. Nathan confronted David. So David was living in unrepentant sin for months, but he did repent. So I'm not at all saying that believers won't have sin or that believers can't fall into major sins or seasons of unrepentance, but God will cause them to repent. If someone is a true believer, God will cause them to repent. So, um, I want to talk about the problem of false conversion is a real problem. Um, There's two passages of scripture I want to look at that talk about. Let's look at Matthew 13, uh, verses 24 through 30. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while uh, his men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the grain had sprouted and become a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares and bind them up in bundles to burn them. But what you, the wheat you gather into my barn. So um, the NKJV and the KJV use tares. Um, the ESV and the NASB use the term weeds, so I decided to look it up, and uh, the Greek word used in this passage for weeds or tares, let's see if I can say it, zizanion, I think it's called zizanion, Um, but you can see at the bottom of this screenshot from Blue Letter Bible that the definition is a kind of darnel resembling wheat except the grains are black, so it's a weed that looks like wheat. I tried to get a picture of it, of the both of them. We can go to the picture. It might be a bit pixelated. Is the picture working? David? Picture? <laughs> so, um, so on the left is wheat before it's fully white, uh, ripe. It's green before it's ripe, and then it turns you know, a brownish color, yellowish brown. And on the right is tares. They look similar 
from afar, but you know, up close you can kind of tell the difference. They look similar, right? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, wheat and tares. But this parable illustrates the problem that there are people who in may some sense look like Christians, but they are not Christians. Let's look at Matthew 7, 21 verse through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So kind of a key thing to consider with this is uh, what is the will of the Father? The will of the Father is that we trust in Christ and repent and receive the free gift of grace. That is the will of the Father for us. I made a a list of things that a person can do and still not actually be a Christian. You can believe in God. Even Satan and demons believe in God. Uh, You can believe God loves you. You can believe Jesus died on the cross and rose again. You can attend church. You can do good things to others. You can serve in the church. You can experience the Holy Spirit to some degree. You can follow a radical preacher or church leader. You can keep the law externally. You can, uh, I guess from what this verse says, even perform miracles and cast out demons. You could even commit your life to ministry or study in the Bible. The Pharisees did. But the reason a person could do all those things and not be a Christian is because you can do each of those things without actually um, trusting that Christ's repentance, uh, that Christ's death, is what justifies you before God. And you can do each of those things without actually submitting to Christ as Lord and repenting. You know, the Pharisees didn't actually submit to God. They only did stuff externally. They didn't actually care about what God wanted, and that's why they crucified the Son of God. You can do a bunch of uh, external things that, that you think Christians do without actually trusting that Christ's death is what justifies you before God, without actually repenting and submitting to him. The scriptures clearly say that all a person has to do to receive Christ, to be saved, is to, um, to repent and trust in him. It's simple, but you know it's something that people miss sometimes. Because sadly, we have churches that don't preach that that's necessary. There are churches, sadly, that don't preach that You know, we need to trust in Christ's death that it justifies us before God or that we need to repent. So sadly, because of that, the problem of people thinking that they're Christians but aren't is a real problem. So the next section I want to look at. I said earlier that the Bible says that we should examine ourselves to see if we're actually in the faith. Well, how do you do that? Let's look at Matthew 7, verses 15 and 20 through 20. Um, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, Uh, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So the Bible points out that there will be specific fruits or specific signs that a person is probably converted. And it also mentions that there will be signs that a person is probably not converted. I'm not necessarily saying that you can know with certainty whether or not someone else is, but the the Bible says you can know them by their fruits. So, 
got 15 minutes left. I think we can make it through this. We're going to try to make it through quickly. So signs that a person has been converted. Um, I've got four of them. Number one, they understand and believe the gospel. Let's look at 1 John 2, 23 through 25. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. Since believing the gospel is one of the only two requirements for conversion, um, understanding and believing the gospel is something I figured we should list as signs that a person has received Christ. Um, Number two, they seek to obey God in every area of life. Not that they succeed at that, none of us succeed at that, but they seek to. Or none of us succeed in obeying God all the time. Let's look at 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So, number two, they seek to obey God in every area of life. Uh, Number three, They have selfless love for others, especially other Christians. Let's look at 1 John verses 4 through 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Let's look at 1 John 2 verse 10. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Let's look at John 13 verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So if a person has been born of God, they'll have love for others, but especially for other Christians. And all these verses, it particularly notes having love for uh, one another, and since it's written to churches, that means to other Christians. So number three, they will have selfless love for others, especially other Christians. And number four, they will quickly confess and repent after they stumble. We all stumble. Uh, But the important thing is if a person quickly confesses and repents, that's a sign that God has done a work in their heart. Let's look at 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If a person is actually seeking to obey God in every area of life, they will quickly confess and repent after they sin. They won't allow sin to linger in their life. They'll quickly confess and repent of it. You know, if a person is really seeking to obey God in every area of life, they won't be content to allow sin to remain without fighting against it. It's not that they'll succeed all the time. You know, we still have the struggle against sin and against the flesh, and we're going to have that struggle until we die. But a person who has been born again won't be content to not fight against their sin. So, uh, signs that a person has not been converted. I want to look at that next. I've got uh, eight of them. And they are all written down in the the notes that are in the outline on the bulletin. So, signs that a person has not been converted. Number one, they pick and choose areas of obedience. So, I'm not talking about giving in to temptations that they struggle with and then repenting. You know, everyone does that. All Christians do that. We all have struggles, and none of us succeed all the time. Um, I'm talking about when a person says that God's command in this area or that area just aren't important or don't need to be followed. Uh, Let's look at 1 John 2, verse 4. 
Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Let's look at 1 John 3, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. We're going to spend a lot of time in 1 John. Um, you know, if a person seeks to obey God in most areas, but has a few areas that they completely ignore, or that they're just fine with sin in those areas, then they don't really seek to obey God at all. You can't just say, well, I obey God in most areas, but this area of sin, God's cool with that. That's me and God's little agreement. That's a lie we get tempted to believe, but if we think that, then we don't really seek to obey God at all. We're content with being Lord of our lives, and we'll just allow Christ to tell us what to do in some areas. But we're still insistent on being lords of our lives if we think that. Let's look at 1 Samuel 15, um, 1 through 23. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all the things they have. Do not spare them. Kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them all in Telaram. 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait. Lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart. Go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness to all the people of Israel when you came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah uh, as far as Shur which is east of Egypt. Then he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fattened calves and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. And all that was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Saul, uh, to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed and went to Gilgal. And Samuel, said, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, and um, you are not the head of the tribes of are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what is evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amal Amalek, and have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took all the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of div divination or witchcraft, and presumption is iniquity as idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. 
So Saul kind of had this attitude that if I obey God in most areas, I can just ignore, you know, this and that, and I, I'm still obeying God. I think Saul is a really good example of a false convert. It seems like Saul was never submitted to God to begin with. Throughout all of Saul's life, he seems to have the idea that obeying God in every area is kind of an optional thing. You know, I'll um, be the king of Israel and fight the wars God wants me to, but David, I don't like that guy. I think I'm going to kill him. Um, you know, obeying God and destroying the things he wants me to destroy, I'll just do that with most of it. He, he kind of has this idea throughout his life that obeying God in every area is kind of an optional thing. You know, God's spirit was with Saul for a time, but then the spirit departed from him and didn't return. And at the end of it, Saul died having never repented and never giving up trying to kill David. But Saul never turned to God in repentance to begin with. So that's uh, the first sign that a person has not been converted. They pick and choose areas of obedience. And again, not that they struggle with a certain sin and then give in and repent, but that they outright just disregard God's commands is not important. Because we all struggle. Number two, um, they think that they haven't sinned or that they don't need God's grace. Let's look at 1 John uh, 1 verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, you know, you need the bad news before you can have the good news. The bad news is that we're sinners and we have sinned. If a person uh, believes they haven't sinned or that they don't need God's grace, that's a sign that they haven't been converted. The third sign a person hasn't been converted. They think that they are a good person or that God accepts them because of their obedience. There was a heresy spreading in the Galatian church uh, in the first century um, that would incline people to think that God would accept them because of their obedience. And Paul was very concerned about that heresy. Let's look at Galatians 3 verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. The Galatians were starting to believe that you need to be circumcised to be saved, and he said that if they were to believe that, they were abandoning the gospel. Let's look at Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there, there are some who trouble you and who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now we say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. By believing that you know, they were saved by trusting in Christ and good works, they were abandoning the gospel. Paul was concerned that they may have been false converts because it was starting to look like they were abandoning the gospel. Let's look at uh, Galatians 3, verses 1 through 4. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, that you are now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? When he says, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain, since it, it's looking like they're about to abandon the gospel, Paul's questioning their conversion. Let's look at Galatians 5, verse 2. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, or if, as in if you accept it for the sake of being righteous before God, Christ will be of no advantage to you. 
So the third sign that a person has not been converted, they think that they're a good person or that God accepts them because of their obedience. I'm going to try to finish this up quickly. Um, The fourth sign that a person has not been converted, if they have hatred towards others, especially if it's towards other Christians. Let's look at 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So, you know, sign number four that a person hasn't been converted. If they have hatred towards others, especially if it's towards other Christians. The fifth sign that a person hasn't been converted. If their life revolves around earthly pleasures instead of revolving around God. Let's look at 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not uh, from the Father, but is of the world. When a person is born again, their priorities change. We should enjoy um, God's gift to us in earthly enjoyment, but, you know, a person's life A Christian's life will revolve around God instead of revolving around earthly pleasures. It's about the priorities. Sixth sign that a person has not been converted. They don't have a willingness to lay down their life for the gospel. Let's look at a few verses real quick. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Mark 8, 34. Then Calling to the crowd uh, to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And Luke 9, verse 23, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. A person can't, if a person doesn't follow Jesus, they're not a Christian. Let's look at John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So all of Jesus' sheep follow him. So by implication, if a person does not follow Jesus, they're not his sheep. But in order to follow Jesus, a person has to be willing to lay down their life. Number seven, uh, they are content to harbor unforgiveness towards others. You know, we all struggle with bitterness and unforgiveness from time to time, but we, we push through it, we rely on God's grace, and we still forgive them. But if a person's content to harbor unforgiveness towards others, that's a dangerous sign. Let's look at Matthew 6, uh, 7 through 15. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Instead, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So there might be a number of ways a person could think to interpret this, but the only way I can think to interpret this is if a person has been born again, they will forgive others. They might struggle with it for a while. They might, you know walk in disobedience for a time, but they will repent and they will forgive others. And then uh, the eighth sign that I have listed that a person has not been converted, they are aware of sins in their life, but don't seek to repent. We'll look at uh, 1 John 3 through six, three verse 6 again. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or knows him. So, those are um, a list of signs that a person hasn't truly received Christ. Uh, The last part that I wanted to talk about is what to do if you have doubts about your conversion. Um, If you have doubts about your conversion, 
ask yourself the two main questions. Number one, do I trust Christ as my Savior? Do I trust that I have a good standing uh, before God for the only reason that Christ died to pay for my sins and that I would otherwise be under the wrath of God with no means of escape? And that that good standing... um, that Christ's blood has purchased for me will be an escape from the wrath of God at the judgment of the world. Ask yourself, uh, do I actually trust that? Do I trust that it's Christ's blood alone and not any of my actions that give me a good standing before God? You know, if the answer is no, then repent of that and choose to trust Christ. The second question to ask yourself, do I submit to Christ as my Lord? Am I committed and resolved to obey God in every area of life, no matter what he tells me to do or what the consequences are? Am I committed to finding out what his will is in every area of my life um, so that I might obey him? And if the answer to that is no, then repent and commit to obeying God in every area. And if the answer to those questions is yes, then you have good reason to have confidence in your conversion. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And if somebody um, is genuinely submitting to God, they're saying that Christ is Lord. And no one can do that but by the Holy Spirit. So if the answer to those two questions is yes, you have great confidence. You should have great confidence. And if the answer to either of those questions is no, you can repent of that and God will give you grace. Uh, Secondly, if if you still struggle with doubts about your conversion, pray. Pray that God would reveal to you any area where you're outright ignoring his commands or aren't submitted to him. Pray that God would reveal to you any areas in which you might not be trusting Christ for salvation. And if you're struggling in either of those areas, pray that God would work in your heart and give you strength through his spirit. Pray that God would give you confidence and assurance of the work that he's done and is doing in your heart. God wants to give us clarity. God will give us clarity if we seek him for it. And the last thing I would recommend if you're struggling with doubts about your conversion is find a pastor to talk to uh, or a discipler and tell them about your concerns. You know, it can really help to have some outside perspective because you might be biased in either direction. Um, I've seen plenty of people who are biasly worrying, am I converted, am I converted, and am I converted? And there's like good evidence in their life that they are, and they trust Christ, and they've repented, but they needlessly worry about it. And sometimes it can just help to have an outsider's perspective. And God gives us pastors and disciples to help us. So that concludes uh, the sermon. But for our communion meditation, we spent a lot of time looking at verses in 1 John, uh, there's one more verse from 1 John I want to look at. First uh, John 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, which, you know, we all do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have an advocate before the Father. You know, we're still fallen and we continue, we'll continue to have struggles against sin until we die. Um, but for when we do sin and we do fail, we can have, know with full confidence that Jesus is always there for us. Not only is he there for us, but he prays for us. He makes intercession for us to God the Father. Let's look at Hebrews 7, verses 23 through 25. The former priests, on one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We never have to worry, well, maybe God is getting sick and tired of me giving into temptation so many times. We don't have to worry about that because Jesus Christ is our advocate before God the Father who is there for us always and who prays for us and intercedes for us. Because of that, we can come before God confidently and boldly. So let's remember that and praise him for it as we come to the table.